The man you see in this photo is one of the most famous men throughout all of maritime history. Most people out there, even those who aren't into ocean liners or maritime history, would be able to tell you who this man is. This man's name is Edward John Smith, and he was the captain of the ill-fated RMS Titanic, and unfortunately he would die on the night that the Titanic went down. However, despite the fact that most people out there already know this, what I was curious about was the untold story of Captain Smith, you know? I was curious if it was possible to go back and look at all the testimony and evidence and try to piece together everything that Captain Smith did on the Titanic during the sinking. That way we could get a better understanding as to how he tried to save lives, you know, how he tried to save his ship from sinking. And ultimately, I was curious as to what was the final fate of Captain Smith? Sure, everybody knows that he did die in the sinking, but my question is, how did he die, you know? Did he go down with the Titanic? Did he try to make a break for it and swim away from the ship in the icy waters? Because we do know he didn't get into a lifeboat. So that's what I've spent all this time researching. And yeah, you're about to see the results of everything that I was able to look up on Captain Smith in today's video. So join me today as we go back and we try to tell the complete story of Captain Smith, one of the Titanic's greatest heroes. <laughs> The following video wouldn't have been possible without the collective works of Titanic Honor and Glory, Part-Time Explorer, Titanic Animations, Maritime Interactive, and the incredible Titanic book On a Sea of Glass. Please check out all of their work in the description below. We are starting off Captain Smith's story during the late evening on April the 14th, 1912. At this time, the Titanic is still steaming across the Atlantic and making very good time. Captain Smith went and attended a dinner party in the Titanic's a la carte restaurant, which was located on B-deck just aft of the aft grand staircase. After he finished his dinner, Captain Smith then headed back up to the Titanic's bridge, where 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller was still currently on duty. Captain Smith had a talk with Lightoller about everything that was going on with the Titanic. They discussed the ship's speed, the weather conditions, and so on and so forth. He also talked about how the weather was absolutely perfect on this particular night. It seemed like to Captain Smith and Lightoller that they could see for miles around in all directions. So, Captain Smith and Lightoller, who also discussed the many ice warnings the Titanic had received on this particular day, decided to keep the Titanic moving at its current speed of 21 knots. However, Captain Smith told Lightoller that if anything changes with the ship's weather conditions, he was to inform Captain Smith immediately. So, after this conversation was completed, Captain Smith then went and retired to his cabin, at which point Lightoller continued his duty on the Titanic's bridge, keeping a sharp eye out for any dangers that may pose a risk to the Titanic. Now, even though Captain Smith had retired to his cabin for the evening, he would still be close by just in case he was needed on the Titanic's bridge. Captain Smith's cabin was located on the port side of the Titanic, just behind the bridge within the officer's quarters on the RMS Titanic. So, as you can see, it would be very easy for Smith to get to the bridge if some kind of situation was to occur. Now, this conversation between Smith and Lightoller occurred at roughly 9.45 p.m. on board the RMS Titanic. And just 15 minutes later, 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller's shift on the Titanic's bridge was over, and he was relieved by 1st Officer William Murdoch, who assumed command of the Titanic at that time. Before Lightoller left the bridge, he had told Murdoch about his conversation with the cab captain, and he also told Murdoch that if anything was to change with the conditions that the Titanic was sailing through on that evening, or if any kind of dangerous situation was to come up, that he was to let Captain Smith know. First Officer William Murdoch said, sure, I've got it. And then right after that, Second Officer Charles Lightoller then retired to his cabin for the evening. Now, for the first hour and a half or so of First Officer William Murdoch's shift on board the Titanic, things were pretty uneventful on board Titanic. However, all that changed at 11.40 p.m. ship's time. At 11.40 p.m., an iceberg was spotted directly ahead of the RMS Titanic. First Officer William Murdoch ordered the Titanic to turn hard to starboard, which, due to tiller commands, means to turn the ship to port. However, his efforts to avoid the iceberg were futile. The Titanic was just way too close to the berg. The RMS Titanic struck the iceberg on the starboard side below the waterline, opening up the first six of the Titanic's 16 watertight compartments to the sea. Now, the force of the impact was felt pretty strongly on the bridge, and the collision wasn't unnoticed by Captain Smith. 
Captain Smith noticed the collision almost immediately after it happened. Within one minute after the Titanic had struck the iceberg, Captain Smith arrived on the Titanic's bridge to find out what had just happened. Immediately after arriving on the Titanic's bridge, Captain Smith then turned to William Murdoch and asked him what had just happened. William Murdoch informed Captain Smith that the Titanic had just struck an iceberg on the starboard side. After hearing this, Captain Smith gave William Murdoch two orders. The first order was to shut all the Titanic's watertight doors, and the second order was to stop the Titanic's engines. Now, First Officer William Murdoch had already done all of this when he was trying to avoid the iceberg in the first place, so there was nothing else for him to do at this time. Now, right after this happened, Captain Smith walked out onto the Titanic's starboard side bridge wing, which was located right here, right where my finger's pointing. And then he peeked over the Titanic's starboard side to see if he could see any visible damage along the Titanic's starboard side hull. He didn't notice any damage above the waterline. However, right after this, he then looked forward, down onto the Titanic's forward well deck, right here and noticed that there was a huge chunk of ice sitting on the forward well deck that had broken off of the iceberg and landed there as a result of the collision. After all of this had happened, 4th Officer Boxhall arrived on the bridge, and once Captain Smith saw him, he ordered 4th Officer Boxhall to go down below deck and inspect for damage. Now, during all this time, Captain Smith noticed that the Titanic seemed to be handling the collision very well. He didn't even notice any type of listing with the Titanic at this time. However, remember, it's only been roughly two minutes since Iceberg Impact. So, since he thought the Titanic may be okay, he decided to go ahead and re-engage the Titanic's engines and have the ship move forward at half a head until a full damage inspection was carried out. Now, keep in mind, any ship that takes damage at sea and begins to take on water, even if that damage won't ultimately cause a ship to sink, a vessel will still list in the direction that the water is coming in due to a loss of buoyancy in that section. The only reason this didn't happen to Titanic right away was due to the fact that before the iceberg impact, the Titanic had a slight 3 degree list to port. This was because the day before, the crew of the Titanic had just put out a coal fire in the starboard side coal bunker of boiler room number 6. And in order to put out this fire, they had to move the coal out of the starboard side coal bunker, 300 tons of it, and move it into a port side coal bunker in the same boiler room. When this was done, this had a noticeable effect on the Titanic's trim, and it caused the Titanic, after this had happened, to have a slight 3 degree list to port. Now, because the Titanic had struck an iceberg on the starboard side, the reason the Titanic didn't immediately list to starboard was due to the fact that the water had to overcome the weight of the 300 tons of coal on the Titanic's port side. This is why Captain Smith didn't immediately notice a starboard list on the ship. However, this didn't take that long to go away. Around three to four minutes after the Titanic had struck the iceberg, enough water had come inside of the Titanic in order to override the weight of the 300 excess tons of coal on the Titanic's port side, and the Titanic began to list to starboard. And of course, Captain Smith noticed this right away. Around six minutes after the iceberg impact, the Titanic had listed far enough to starboard that Captain Smith decided that he had to stop the ship until he knew for certain how badly the ship was damaged. At 11.46 p.m., Captain Smith gave the order to shut down the Titanic's engines. This is the last time the Titanic would move forward under her own steam. Now, right around the time that Captain Smith gave the order to shut down the Titanic's engines, 4th Officer Boxhall arrived on the bridge once again and told Captain Smith that he did not see any flooding in the forward sections of Titanic. However, it's important to note that this first inspection by Boxhall was very brief. Right after he told Captain Smith this, he then decided to head down to the Titanic's mailroom and see if there was any flooding in that particular area on the Titanic. Now, at the time of the iceberg impact, the Titanic had been operating at near maximum steam pressure. However, after the Titanic hit the iceberg and Captain Smith gave the order to stop the engines for the last time, the steam pressure now had nowhere to go since it wasn't being fed into the Titanic's engines anymore. The steam pressure within the Titanic was continuing to build up and build up. Now, if something wasn't done to relieve this steam pressure, then the Titanic seriously had a risk of potentially exploding. Remember, you can't shut off a steam engine like you shut off a gas-powered engine we have today. However, the builders of the Titanic had taken this into account, and what they had done was they had equipped the Titanic with safety valves, 
And once the steam pressure within the Titanic had exceeded its maximum limit, these safety valves would automatically lift up and let this excess steam pressure out. This started on board the Titanic at 11.58 p.m. And while this would stop the Titanic from potentially exploding due to an overload of steam pressure, the process of venting out this steam was extremely loud and it made it very hard for Captain Smith and the other crewmen on the Titanic's boat deck to communicate with themselves and the Titanic's passengers. The steam pressure inside the Titanic would continue to be vented out over the course of the next hour to an hour and a half. So this really did hurt them when they were trying to evacuate the Titanic. However, nothing could be done about this. They had to get rid of that steam pressure somehow. Now at roughly 11.50 p.m., Captain Smith headed out to do his own brief inspection of the Titanic. Exactly where he went during this first inspection is unclear. However, he returned to the bridge just seven minutes later at 11.57 p.m. and told the crew to begin prepping the Titanic's lifeboats. He didn't tell them to swing the boats out yet. He just told them to go through the initial preparation steps for the boats just in case they were needed. A few minutes later, Captain Smith left the bridge once again and headed down to the Titanic's engine room, where he met up with the Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, and the Titanic's chief engineer, Joseph Bell. Once these three men met up, they then headed down Scotland Road to head down to the forward sections of the Titanic to do a more detailed inspection of their stricken liner. As Smith, Andrews, and Bell headed down Scotland Road, which was a corridor located on the Titanic's E-deck level that spanned nearly the entire length of the ship, one of the first areas that they wanted to check out was the Titanic's mail room, which was located in the Titanic's fourth watertight compartment. However, the mail room was located on a deeper deck within the Titanic. The mail room was essentially a two-story complex that was occupied on both the Titanic's Orlop deck and G deck. Now, when these three men arrived in the area where the mail room was, there was a staircase there that allowed them to look down from the E deck level all the way down to the G deck level, so they could basically see the first floor of the mail room. However, when these men got there, it was around 12, 10 a.m., and they saw some postal workers on the Titanic's E deck level trying to move bags of mail that they saved from the post office or mail room and get it up to a higher deck. When these three men looked down that staircase down to the Titanic's G-Deck level and the mailroom, they saw that G-Deck was already completely underwater. There was no way any of these men could get into the Titanic's mailroom. As soon as Smith, Andrews, and Bell saw the situation in the Titanic's mailroom, the three men immediately turned around and began to head away from the area. Right around this time, a stewardess by the name of Annie Robinson was standing in the area where Smith and Andrews just walked past her, and she overheard Andrews tell Captain Smith, well, three have gone already, Captain. When Andrews told Smith that three had gone already, what he was referring to was the Titanic's first three watertight compartments, and basically what he was telling Smith was that these compartments were already completely flooded. Right after this very brief exchange between Smith and Andrews, Smith, Andrews, and Bell all went their own separate ways, and each man had their own tasks they were going to perform on board the Titanic. Thomas Andrews and Joseph Bell both went out to do their own inspections of the Titanic, while Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge to begin overseeing the initial stages of the evacuation. Remember, the Titanic was not yet declared doomed. However, Captain Smith wanted to be ready just in case the worst case scenario should be confirmed. Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge at roughly 12, 12, 12, 13 a.m. And once he got there, he ordered all of the Titanic's lifeboats to be swung out over the ship's side. He also told his crew to go down below deck and begin waking up the Titanic's passengers. And he also told the crew to get them up onto the boat deck as quickly as possible. And he also said to make sure that the passengers had their life jackets on. Right after this order was given, Captain Smith then headed to the Marconi room where he met up with Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, the Titanic's wireless operators. He told them to get ready to send out one of the Titanic's distress calls. However, he told them not to do it until he returned and told them to do so. He didn't want to send out a distress call message prematurely. After this happened, Captain Smith returned to the bridge where he would wait on Thomas Andrews to return to him and let him know if the Titanic was going to sink or not. Thomas Andrews arrived on the Titanic's bridge just a short time later and told Captain Smith the terrible news. The Titanic was too badly damaged and she was going to sink. Right after hearing this, Captain Smith gave the order to begin filling the lifeboats with the Titanic's passengers, and he also gave his famous order of women and children first. 
Right after he did this, Captain Smith returned to the bridge to begin working out the Titanic's actual position so he could give it to the wireless operator so they could put it in the Titanic's distress call message. However, once Captain Smith worked out the Titanic's position, he made a slight error when he was trying to figure out where the ship was, and the distress call position he gave Jack Phillips and Harold Bride was roughly 20 miles to the west of where Titanic actually was. However, he didn't catch this mistake, and he gave it to the Titanic's wireless operators, and they began to transmit the Titanic's first distress call messages at roughly 12.27 a.m. Now, with the exception of the private meeting between Captain Smith and Thomas Andrews, it seems like that there was never any type of formal meeting between Captain Smith and the other members of the Titanic's crew about the fact that the Titanic was actually sinking. And honestly, I can understand why. Because think about it. All of the Titanic's crew members that are assisting with the evacuation already know that something serious is going on because they're prepping the lifeboats. And Smith already had his officers out there, you know, working on or telling them, you know, hey, we need to lower these boats away, fill them up with women and children first, you know. They knew something serious was going on without being told for certain that, hey, yeah, we're done. And think about it. If Captain Smith would have pulled all of his crew up to the Titanic's bridge to tell them, hey, yeah, we're sinking. Well, in a situation like a sinking ship, Every second counts in a situation like this. So for every minute he had the crew in the bridge just to tell them that, yeah, we're sinking, that's another minute that they've lost in launching the Titanic's lifeboats, helping the passengers get up on deck, and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's just one thing to keep in mind. Unlike what we saw in the James Cameron film, there was no official meeting between Captain Smith and all the members of the Titanic's crew. Word of the coming disaster was simply spread by word of mouth only. Immediately after leaving the Marconi room, Captain Smith returned to the Titanic's bridge where he ran into 4th Officer Boxhall, who had returned to the bridge after hearing reports that a mystery ship had been spotted off of the Titanic's port side. When Boxhall ran into Captain Smith, he asked Smith if the situation was serious. Captain Smith told Boxhall that it was, and he also told Boxhall that Thomas Andrews didn't give the ship more than an hour to an hour and a half to live. Upon learning about the mystery ship seen off of the Titanic's port side, Captain Smith also began thinking about ways to try to contact this mystery ship, because if it could be signaled and reached, this ship could come over and save everybody on board the Titanic. However, what Captain Smith did not realize at that time was that all efforts to contact this mystery ship would be completely in vain. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I hate to do this to all of you, but I think this is the spot where we're going to have to pause Captain Smith's story for now. I really did try to put everything into one video, but there's just so much information on Captain Smith that I got to do this as a multi-parter. So just stand by for episode two. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure you leave it a like. And if you're new here, please subscribe and I will see you all in the next one. Have a great evening, everybody.